Well, good to see you all this morning. It's good to be back. Um, our family enjoyed a little bit of vacation in the Reno and Tahoe area. We saw uh, Jason and Naomi Ching and their family. It's really nice. So we bring greetings from Dayspring Church. Um, as you may or may not know, Jason was a part of um, Brian Borgman's church there at Grace Community in Minden. And then during 2020, they planted a church, Dayspring, right there in Reno, which has always been their heart to do. And uh, it's really neat to see this church plant with about 100 people there, um, meeting a school, doing well. So I bring greetings from them. Jason will be preaching for us in July. Uh, he and Naomi and their family will be here. So we're looking forward to that as well. Uh, but this morning, we're continuing our Sunday School Discipleship Hour series on prayer. And this week, um, we'll, look, we'll start moving into Paul's prayers. I know Ryan was working through the Lord's Prayer. And um, we'll, we'll take a look this morning at Colossians 1, as you can see on your handout. So hopefully you had a chance to pick up a handout. And that will give you, it has the passage there. And then we'll just walk through it and discuss some of these things together. So... Um, why don't I pray, and then we'll, we'll dive in. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, to consider your word, to consider what it says about prayer. We pray that you would encourage us as we do. Thank you for the privilege that it is to be able to come to you in prayer. We pray that we may find more joy and delight in it, that we could find a, a comfort and an intimacy in it, that we could know what's on your heart as we reveal our hearts to you. And so help us to just keep growing in this, uh, even as we study this together. Thank you for the way you've given us instruction in your word, and we pray that you'd help us to understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, um, I, I'm just curious about this kind of by way of survey. I know this isn't like an official survey or anything, but I'm wondering how many of you, when you are going to be meeting someone that you haven't seen in a while, how many of you think through conversation points you may bring up during it? Anyone do that? I saw, thank you, thank you. Okay, I'm not alone. That, that's really all I wanted to, the only reason I wanted to ask that is uh, um, I find that sometimes going into social situations when I feel like I'm flying blind and haven't thought ahead of time, I can find myself just blankly staring at another person. Some of you um, may have experienced that from me. And uh, if you have, please know it's not out of a heart of rudeness. Um, I often have trouble sh shifting gears. If you've ever caught me when I've been in the middle of studying or thinking about something and then try and talk to me about something, you may get kind of a deer in the headlights look. And uh, that has nothing to do with you. That's just the slowness of my brain adjusting to the person in front of me. Um, that's part of the creaturely condition, isn't it? I think we all deal with it in various ways. Some of us may be real confident that we can just on the fly talk to somebody. Others of us may give forethought. Depends on the situation, whatever. I say all that to say this. The creaturely experience of talking to another person can often mimic the creaturely experience of talking to God. Um, we can come to a time of prayer or be experiencing something in life where we know we should be praying, but have you ever had the experience where you just go blank? I, I don't even know what I should be praying. Um, now, we know Romans 8 talks about the Spirit helping us even when we don't know how to pray with groans that are too deep for words to express. I mean, that concept by itself is just amazing and it's comforting. And so we keep that in mind, and there will still be times, even with a cheat sheet, when we don't know what to pray. But as Ryan has been unpacking with the Lord's Prayer, there are some good structures and handles to think about that can kind of be talking points in our prayer life. And I find Paul's prayers are really helpful that way too. Um, when we read what he says as a whole, it can feel like a fire hose maybe. I mean, Paul just talks in a fire hose way, or at least writes in a fire hose way, I think. His paragraphs are so dense and so tied together. Um, but when we break it down, one of the things I really appreciate about his writings is if you just grab a few handles, one or two, um, it's helpful. And you can just add to them over time. And the way this passage in Colossians 1 is structured actually provides us with some really helpful handles. And so that's 
um, what I want us to look at this morning. I, I think of this as kind of divinely inspired talking points when we go to God in prayer. So that if we find ourselves blanking out, we can say, what was that in Colossians 1 Paul was talking about? And one or two of these phrases could pop into our minds, or we look back at this passage and pray this passage, and it it helps uh, get our mind going as we transition into um, conversing with God. It is good and biblical to pray using the Bible as a guide. I know Ryan's been talking about that too, but um, we don't need to feel like we're cheating if we have to use Scripture to help us know what to say to God. It's actually a really good place to be. Um, so let's, let me read Colossians 1, 9 to 14. Um, yeah, and, and just so you know, one of the things that I've done at various times um, in, in my prayer time is print these passages for me as a cheat sheet prayer starter guide. And maybe you've done that as well or you have them marked in your Bible. Um, but just even just reading this passage can call to mind all these things, and and you could always use it that way as well. So, Colossians 1, 9 to 14. It says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Even just reading that, it's fire hose again. (laughs) I mean, there's just so much there. I I love Paul's heart and how those things can just flow from him as he writes them. But I confess, I have to slow down and break them into pieces. Otherwise, uh, it's easy to get lost. And so as, as we come to this section, just by way of context, Paul is praying for the Colossians. Um, He says there in verse 9, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Um, The day they heard is hearing of their faith in Christ and the love that they have for all the saints, which is earlier there in verse 4. So since the day we've heard of your conversion and the church that's happening here and the ministry there, we, Paul and his team, are daily praying for this group of believers. And what are they praying asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. They're praying that these believers would know God's will and that they would know it so well that it could be described as being full of the knowledge of it. Knowing it so well, you're filled with the knowledge of God's will. So if you're following along in your handout, this is really the main request there on page two, that they would know God's will. But then we can unpack it a bit more with the various things that they would say about it. When you think about knowing God's will, what immediately comes to mind for you? And I I won't pass the mic for this because just call it to mind, but we'll pass the mic in a, a few minutes. When I think of praying about God's will, I usually think about the sovereign secret will of God. Um, I usually think about what is this thing that I'm supposed to do? Should I, um, well, I'm not regularly thinking, should I take a different job? So don't think that, but like life decision-y type things. (laughs) Should I move? Should I take a different job? Should I um, pursue this thing or that thing? When I think about praying God's will, it's usually these big decision, know the future-y type things. But that's not what Paul's talking about here, right? That's the sovereign, the secret will of God, as we often distinguish it in theology. What Paul's talking about here is knowing the moral or revealed or will of desire of God, what he wants for us to be doing. And notice how he unpacks that. Um, He he prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. The prayer for God's will is really the result that we'd walk, we'd live 
in a manner that's worthy of the Lord, meaning in accord with all that Christ has done for us and all that we are in him, and fully pleasing to him in a way that's, that's pleasing to God, in a way that's oriented toward the things of God's heart. And so this praying for God's will, um, uh, da, 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 da. praying for God's will is really almost as simple as praying for a God honoring walk, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And what I love about walk is when I think about that, it's far less about know the future. It's far less about sovereign will of God. It's not crystal ball language, not that we think that, but sometimes we may come to, to God that way. Walk is one foot in front of another foot. Walk is what is the next step? Um, I find that to be a helpful handle. With whatever we're facing in life, we can come to God in prayer with the request that we would know his will in the sense of, what's the next step in my walk in whatever the situation may be? From the biggest of them to the smallest of them. On your way to work, what's the next step in my walk as I walk through the door and as I talk to that person again or as I work on that assignment that is just driving me crazy, whatever it might be. Lord, help me know what would be pleasing to you as a next step. Do you see the similarity right away with the Lord's Prayer with your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? How that's saying God's will in heaven being perfectly carried out, but we're also asking, will you help me to carry out your will for my life with the next step of the thing that's in front of me? Um, it, it really boils it down. And in some ways, this is actually really simple, isn't it? There's one thing we need to pray about. Lord, help me to please you. Help me to do something that's in accord with the character of Jesus. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.9 says, So whether we are at home or away, uh, speaking of whether we're with Christ or whether we're, we're here not yet with him, one thing, we make it our aim our goal to please him. Um, several years ago, we filmed an observation video with Charlie Hodges um, about dealing with bipolar um, experiences. And he has this phrase that he often uses, and I think it's a helpful phrase. He says that the, the goal of this verse is that we'd want to please God more than we'd even want to breathe. We make it that much of a goal. I think that's interesting. Um, that's what our orientation of life is to be. So what does God want you to pray about today for yourself, for other people, that we would please God? Now, some, some of that is very clear, isn't it? When we say, Lord, help me to know the next step in doing something that's pleasing to you, right away, there, are, there is a whole list of things that we know are not pleasing to God, Right? And so it helps orient us to that. Okay, what things in whatever this next step to, uh, should be would be not pleasing to God? Using my tongue in this way, using my hands in this way, thinking these types of thoughts. These are not pleasing to God. And so that's clear. Um, sometimes what is pleasing to God is really clear to us. Other times it's actually pretty complicated because as fallen creatures— our thoughts are not his thoughts. Um, we often want our, our will more than we want God's will. And so it can be complicated by that. Many times what we think would be a good step or a good thing is often slightly distorted by our own desires. We can be self-focused about things and we can think, well, this is a really good thing to do. Um, but it's the thing that we want, and we're kind of overlooking this better thing to do for another person. Uh, so you see some of the complexities of asking, Lord, what would be pleasing to you? Um, there often is not just one right answer about this. And that's part of the beauty of prayer, is 
that this prayer for a God-honoring next step is one that right from the start requires a lot of dependence, doesn't it? It requires wisdom. It's going to the Lord and processing our heart about the situation, the complexities of the situation, and how God would view the situation. Just by way of example, this is something that we've talked about before um, back in our neighboring class, but I think it's good to, to bring it back up. We know that something good to do before God is to love our neighbor, right? That's pretty simple. Comes at the top of the list. But, and, and so it's so simple on the one hand, right? And yet, it's also so complicated, isn't it? As far as what is the right way to love my neighbor right now in the situation that I'm in? There are many ways we could love our neighbors, right? We could bake cookies. We could watch their kids for them. We could house sit. We could have them over for a meal. We could leave them alone because it looks like they're in the middle of an argument or something. And we could just mind our own business. Like that might be the loving thing to do in that moment. And so there are all kinds of situational things happening. And then this, con this co command to love our neighbor, which we know falls right at the top of the list, also comes within a context of a whole bunch of other commands and callings upon our lives as well, right? So who is our closest neighbor? Um, our spouse, our children, our family, this, this person that God has in our life at this particular time. And so loving our literal neighbors also comes in the context of are we loving our closest neighbors and doing what's good for those God has placed in our family life. We're also called to work and to be productive. And so Love of neighbor doesn't typically mean that we quit our job and just devote our attention wholly to them, doing whatever would be most loving, right? And so you see the complexity there of, Lord, there's all these things that I'm called to be doing. There are all these commands. But when what Paul has us ask here for ourselves, and you see how you'd pray this for other people, right? Because as you think about someone else's situation of what they're facing, they're in the same predicament as we are in the midst of the complexities of what God would want us to do. And so when we're saying that we want to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God, we're asking for wisdom in the midst of what we're facing, of what could be a good next step that's honoring to him. And it's probably not the only next step. We may not even know that it's the best next step, but we're depending on him and conversing with God uh, to see about what step to take. Does that make sense? And then I want to talk about one more aspect of this initial request, and then I want to open it up to hear what you're thinking, how you're processing it, if you have any questions, and then we'll move on to um, the rest of the handout, all right? This is a, a key word that's important not to miss there. He says, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray, pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding is what we were just unpacking. It takes wisdom, it takes understanding to navigate all that. But notice that word there, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We need wisdom, we need understanding. The word spiritual there governs both words. That it's a wisdom, and spiritual doesn't mean here some ethereal, mystical type thing. Spiritual is related to that which comes from the Holy Spirit himself. We need the Holy Spirit's help with wisdom. We need the Holy Spirit's help with understanding. Um, this is a huge part of the Holy Spirit's role in our lives. You know, sometimes we talk about, as Reformed people, we leave out one person of the Trinity. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible, but we leave out the Holy Spirit. Um, just kind of a funny thing to say. Uh, we try really hard not to do that at GBC. Hopefully you hear that uh, in our prayers. But, but that's one thing that's, that's really important to see in this passage is when we come to God in prayer asking to know what would be pleasing to the Lord Jesus. Notice how triune it is, right? We're coming to the Father asking for wisdom and understanding of what would be pleasing to the Lord Jesus, what would be in accord with who he is and what he's doing in our life. And we're asking that the Spirit would help us do that by giving us wisdom and understanding about the situation we're in. 
which is the wisdom and understanding that the Holy Spirit brought to the Lord Jesus while he was living incarnate here on earth. That he was walking each moment of the day, empowered by the Spirit, dependent upon him for the wisdom and understanding to know what the next step would be in talking to his mom, his siblings, working as a carpenter, walking out and healing people, dealing with just the things of life. And that's what we're asking for too. Would the Holy Spirit help us to give us really the mind of Christ? Paul elaborates on all this in 1 Corinthians 2. And, and let me just listen to this about how it relates to in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, which again, even as we hear that, don't you think back to Isaiah 11, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding that will be upon the servant of the Lord. Um, but here, 1 Corinthians 2, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, our inner understanding. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. We've, rec we've received the spirit who is from God. Why? That we might understand the things freely given us by God, the insight into himself and how we are to view the world that's freely given to us in his word and through the work of Christ. The Spirit is the one who helps us understand that. Verse 14, the natural person does not accept these things. In fact, they cannot. Verse 15, but we now as spiritual people, he really says, can judge and discern these things of God. Why? Because we have the mind of Christ, the Spirit-empowered way of thinking about, observing, seeking wisdom and understanding about what God's will is of how to walk in a Christ-like way wherever we may be. So with that, as you, you know, think about your handout, I know even that, and this is how Paul is, and then I'm, I'm adding even more words to it, I guess. So, but praying for God's will, you know, we think of that as honoring in accord with Jesus, the Lord. And then we also think of it as um, wisdom, understanding from the Spirit. So you see how all that's working together when we come to God with a situation we're facing or someone else is facing. So what are your thoughts about that? How do you hear that as I'm talking about it? Maybe nothing new for you, maybe a reminder. Um, how does it encourage you? Do you have any questions about that? Jared has the microphone, I believe. So I'd love to hear from you. Sorry, Robin speaking. Yeah, let's, is it, uh, is it good, John? Okay, can you hear me now? Do you love being put on the spot like this, Robin? Is it your favorite thing? <laughs> Do you wish in staff meeting we passed a microphone around? <laughs> okay, set now? No. You can go for it and he'll, uh, he'll get it up. Um, I think it's really important that we have prayer that we can, that we can oh, there. That we can, I think it's helpful to think about in the day to day that we can talk to the Lord. Okay, what's, what's your will for me right now in this next step at the grocery store or maybe in the bigger? Oh, this is going to be a big interaction. I really need your help. So that's great to think about it just in the moment by moment. Yeah, so in case uh, you weren't able to hear that, Robin was just saying how helpful that is in the moment by moment, just being able to offer that prayer up. Lord, what's your will for me right now in the grocery store you mentioned as we're driving, as we enter a situation? And you know, yeah, Kevin? I, I tend to think that in the day-to-day -day things, I already know what to do, and I only ask God for the things that are really difficult, really puzzling, 
uh, are, are beyond my ability to control or to understand. So this kind of helps me to think it's good to be in this dependent frame of mind all the time, even for the small things. Um, that will be a constant exercise to go to him right away before I have wrestled with something and struggled to try to do it on my own. I, I think that gives voice to uh, our experience quite a bit, right? That, oh, we only bother God with the really big things, and we only think to pray, it tends to be, after we've tried everything. <laughs> and this, this just flips it on its head of the, hey, we could ask that first. Um, could and even should. Um, in an offer of help that God has genuinely given us. You know, in productivity studies and stuff, there's what's the next best thing, you know, and so we're just constantly to think about that. Okay, I've got my next block of time. What's the most important, like, what's the priority here? It's interesting in the life of a believer, really, we're kind of always coming to God with that question. Okay, what's the next best thing now as I'm at work? Oh, I'm now at home. Oh, lunch is over. Here's the afternoon. What's what would be pleasing to you with this afternoon? This can be a rhythm like breathing, um, but so often it's more what, what Kevin was so, I think, accurately describing for us. It's only the end of a ton of exhaustion and frustration, and then we're like, okay, Lord, what do you want? I tried it my way. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's great. Anyone else? Yeah, great. Whatever you'd like, Jared, you get to pick. Which, which one would be pleasing to the Lord? Well, for those that don't know me, I'm Jared's mom from Florida. But um, in the past year, I have lost my husband. And I've had to really, really depend on the Lord. And he is, he's brought me through a lot. I know my husband is, you know, he's whole again, and I will see him again. It's still hard. But... The most recent experience that I had is we had another home that was a rental, and I, um, the tenants moved out, left me with some problems. But anyway, um, it's been sold, but the wait, you know, you know, waiting for it to be sold and the issues and everything, but the Lord has brought me through it, and so... Well, it's, it's great to have you with us. It's good to be able to, to meet you. And thanks for sharing that as well. And amazing how in, in such big and heavy things, and then in the little things, and in all of it, the Lord is there helping. Yeah. Yeah. of conversing with him about it that does really good things in us, right? And he uses that. Because then we're doing something not because we thought of it and it's a great idea. We're doing it to honor him in his help. And how much more glorifying is that? And how much is that in accord with how Jesus did everything he did? I saw um, one more, and then we'll, I think there was one more. Was that you, Bruce? At church, it's Bruce and Sylvia. At home, it's mom and dad. Happy Father's Day, by the way. We'll talk about oh, that thank later. thank you. But. Uh, yeah, I, just, uh, I was like, amen to Kevin's point that he was making because, uh, like, I know for me personally, and this is no reflection on Craig, me being his dad, um, I, I can really get caught in the minutia of, you know, like, what is God's will and it being this big mystery and stuff like that. And, and... And like the minutia of life, like the little things, you know, and I guess that's what like some of these words are really resonating with me, like walk, you know, things like that. It's easy to get fixated on the other stuff and not think like, like you said, Kevin, that you, that you need him in these. And it's really so neat that God loves us that he spelled, he says so much about his, <clears throat> his will and his word so that it really simplifies things a lot because like in this situation, like playing a card game with my wife last night or something like that, you know, um, you know, what would be the, well, that's, that's not a good example, but, um, <clears throat> but I, I guess just in, in any little thing, um, you know, what would be, you know, like, like right up out there on the list, you know, uh, she is my closest neighbor. 
what would be the close or what would be the loving thing to do and how can I best um, please you in this which like to your point Kevin a lot of times I'm thinking about the big stuff instead and uh, and you know I just find it so helpful I guess and, and this is just this is great stuff that's great well, thanks, everyone. That's really helpful. It's great to process together. I'm going to open it back up, too. So if you're, you're sitting on some things, um, I think part of talking about prayer together is just realizing we're all in the same creaturely experience of trying to grow and talking to a Heavenly Father who wants to hear from us and um, is doing that by the Spirit. Okay, so... These things now are related as we, as we turn, you know, in your handout to page three and we continue on in the passage. I think as we think about it, the top priority would be that we learn to make this more of a rhythm. Oh, I should pray about God's will for this. And so we learn that step, but then it can be crickets. <laughs> you can be like, well, okay, I did that. That's great. Um, and that's where these four participles not only are a delight to everyone who likes grammar, but uh, also super helpful handles for us in, uh, in how Paul, Paul arranges this. Because this is what I find happens. Normally, I'm in the rhythm of life, and it's like, oh, got to figure this thing out. I'll do this. And then, then it doesn't go well. Okay, I guess I should pray about it. Lord, what would you want to have happen? And then there's just a big pause. How much better if we're going to the Lord in prayer, but then have some things to jog our minds of what kinds of things are often in accord with the Lord's will. And that's what these are. So Paul elaborates with these four ING words, these four participles, and we'll just walk through them together. The first one there is in verse 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. And then here's where the list comes. Bearing fruit in every good work. Bearing fruit in every good work. I just want to point out a few things about this. So we'll talk about one and two, and then we'll open it up for input, and then we'll talk about three and four, and then we'll um, wrap up together. But bearing fruit Notice, first of all, let's start with the every good work. I think some of the place that we can tend to go wrong is we have too narrow of a definition of good work. When we think of a good work, it's only this like super pious thing of a ministry thing or a missions thing, and that's where we bear fruit. We kind of look at these, we're, and then we get caught up in asking like, what's the ultimate good work? Kind of this secret will of God thing again, right? Instead, realizing there's all kinds of good work throughout the day we'll be doing. Good work in talking to someone. Good work in actually like job-related things that are being measured that way. Good work around the home. Good work in caring for um, a loved one. Good work in just being a citizen in this world. So we are in this context of all kinds of opportunity for good work. There are options for good works in front of us. And then, once we see that, we could say, how would I bear fruit? How would God want to work in me by his spirit? Remember, fruit of the spirit. How is the spirit seeking to bear fruit in my life as I go about these good works that have been placed before me to do? And then that takes us to um, Galatians 5, right? And so just by way of jogging our memory, we can hear the fruit of the spirit. Love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now that really jogs your mind, right? Okay, <laughs> here's the next thing in my life. What is the good work before me to do? And then how could I grow, how does the Spirit want to help me bear fruit in that? Is it by being more patient? Does he want to grow patience in me as I deal with this spreadsheet that I just can't figure out or whatever it might be? Patience as we're dealing with um, people. Patience as we're dealing with circumstances. Is it love? Probably seeking to cultivate love. Joy as I do these things. Goodness, faithfulness. So much of living this life in a way that's honoring to God that often gets kind of downplayed is just faithfulness in it. Just showing up and seeking to please the Lord 
is a sign that the Spirit is working, giving us endurance in these things? Is it gentleness? Is it self-control? Is it self-control even as we do things like relax or enjoy leisure or rest? Um, there's always fruit that the Spirit is seeking to cultivate. So, as we're saying, Lord, help me please you with this next thing. Help me be attuned to fruit that you're seeking to bear in my life in this situation. And you see how that reorients when we come to God with a really difficult thing, like, ah, work is just so hard, or, oh man, this, this relational conundrum, I just don't know. What fruit are you seeking to cultivate in me? What fruit maybe you be seeking to cultivate in the other person? And that helps us have compassion and resituate us, right? And so, first one, bearing fruit in every good work is something that can jog our mind of what we could pray for God's help. Second, increasing in the knowledge of God. That we would increase in the knowledge of God. Now, knowledge is not just facts. It's not just data or trivia. Um, we do need to know some of the data and the facts from Scripture. But biblical knowledge is knowing and responding accordingly. Um, reciting all kinds of facts about someone doesn't mean that you necessarily know them. I know a lot of facts about Taylor Swift, either to my pride or shame, but uh, I don't know Taylor Swift. And sh if you said Craig Marshall uh, talks about you sometimes at church and it's weird, she'd say, I don't even know who that guy is, even though I know stuff about her. Um, so also in our relationship with God, but in a much more sanctified way. And so we're, part of our prayer could be, God, how can I better know you in the midst of this good work that I'm going about doing? Knowing you from what I know of you in your word and hear preached to also knowing that that is really true of you and I have experienced that and I see that at work as I think about you and as I'm interacting with God throughout the day. Another way of saying increasing in the knowledge of God could be, God, what are you trying to teach me about yourself now or in this or today? What are you trying to, how are you trying to show me more of who you are as I'm experiencing this thing in life? Help me grow in my knowledge of you even as I deal with this situation that could seem so mundane or so overwhelming. All right, so let's, let's pause there for just a moment. Bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Any thoughts about how you've done that, how that could be helpful? Um, how do you hear bearing fruit and increasing in the knowledge of God? I'll just say that's way more intentional than I usually am about it. Yeah, I, I think we could probably amen that, right? Uh, does anyone feel like that's a more intentional way of thinking about life and prayer than we often have? Hopefully it's intentional and extreme. I find it extremely relevant too um, because these things are just, they apply in every situation. I can come to God with this every time. Anything else? Yeah, Anna, and then Pipe. I think I appreciate the fact that um, maybe it's not increasing in the knowledge of God, but deepening in the knowledge of God, that he, when I'm in that place of question, um, he shows himself to be more faithful, mm. and I can remember the things of the past that I've gone through that um, confirm that or affirm that in my heart, so I'm not upset or um, maybe throwing my hands up at a situation that I don't have an answer, but I know that because of what he's done for me in the past, I can rely on him still, even though I still have this big question mark in my mind. Yeah. No, that's, that's really good. 
I, I think that's a really helpful way to think about it, especially to counter a tendency we might have when we hear increasing in the knowledge of God to think more facts. Um, switching that out with deepening in the knowledge of God, that captures the biblical essence of what knowing God better is. It's not necessarily I have more facts. It's that I see him more for who he is based on his path's faithfulness, and I, I know him in that sense. This is his character. This is his heart, and it's um, connecting more in a, a deeper way. That's really good. Piper, did you have something? I was just going to say, like, bearing fruit. Whenever I hear that, I'm like, wow, that's a lot of work. Uh-huh. Like, <laughs> and it's obvious, like, like pouring all this time and effort into a person and like but not being too pushy of like you know it's just a hard scenario and so when I hear it I'm like oh my gosh they always say that but like I have friends that's cool like I'm not pouring my soul into them but like Mm. I really enjoy hanging out with them and I'm trying to show them the gospel yeah and so just realizing like but the reason why is like not only to like it helps deepen your understanding of like God and stuff but also like you're showing God's grace of like that's what he did for me Mm. so I'm just like I'm trying to help these other people but also like I'm realizing myself like new things that I can use to like help other people yeah and bear fruit no that's great yeah the bear fruit thing is amazing because it it can end up producing you know, external fruit of things that God does in other people's lives, like in your friends' lives and all of that. And then also, as we're depending on the Lord in this way, he's producing this fruit within us that contributes to that whole process. Um, It is amazing to me, again, bearing fruit being an agricultural metaphor. Yeah, we put effort into like fertilizing, trying to get water, the right soil, pruning, all those kinds of things. But then trees and plants, they just things pop out of them, right, in ways that go far beyond what we could ever contribute to it. And so also in our sanctification, we are working in this way, but then the Spirit is causing things to come out of us that are Christ-honoring, that can far surpass what we would ever be able to do ourselves. It's really good. Well, let's look at the last two. Um, Being strengthened to persevere and then giving thanks to the Father. So um, I've reworded a little bit verse 11, but verse 11 says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. And so I've just shortened that a little bit. I mean, being strengthened is the participle handle to have. Lord, help me to be strengthened. But notice what it, it says about that. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience. This is amazing because it's not just be strengthened with as much as I could strengthen my muscles or my relational muscles or my social aptitudes or whatever it is. It's being strengthened with all God's mighty power. It's being strengthened by heavenly power. The spirit wrought might of God himself strengthening you. That's what we're we're praying for. That's what we see consistently in Scripture. We think back to Isaiah 40, and like, humanly, we run out of strength, but we bring our weakness, and our strength is renewed with strength that comes from God. And so also here, when we're saying, Lord, give me strength, help me to be strengthened, it's not that we can somehow muster up that strength ourselves. It's saying, give me your heavenly strength strength by the Spirit. Now, what is that strength for? For all endurance and patience. If we look up those two words, um, what you tend to notice is they tend to describe two different aspects of the same thing. They tend to describe perseverance, but one being persevering in um, difficult circumstances and one being persevering with difficult people. And you see these contexts throughout Scripture as we find these words. Man, Paul is just so great as the Lord inspired him to write this, right? Because can you think of what more you need strength for? The difficult circumstances and the difficult people situations? 
people, that's where we need strength. And that's right where God promises to give us his heavenly strength. And that's something that he wants us to come to him about in prayer. This is beyond me before we get to the point that we've tried everything. This is beyond me to take the next step that's pleasing to you. I'm exhausted. I'm worn out. I don't even know what to do. Spirit, will you give me wisdom of what would be honoring to the Lord? God, will you strengthen me by the Spirit with the very strength that empowered the Lord Jesus that comes from heaven that he even now is pouring out upon us? Strengthen me to take that next step, to hang in there um, with the circumstance or the personal situation that's going on. I think this also redefines how we think about the power of God in a situation, though, isn't it? I think for me, when I come to God in prayer, asking him to work powerfully in a situation, what I'm usually asking is that it would change and change quickly. <laughs> That's how heaven's power would be displayed, kind of the miraculous, right? The miraculous healing. It is right and good to pray about that. Lord, change this situation. Change this person's heart, this person who doesn't know you, this person who's stuck in sin, this whatever. Like, by, like heaven's power, change this. But this also shows us that heaven's power can be just as much at work in us enduring in the midst of that situation as when that situation changes. That's something that's hard to wrap our minds around as Christians, and I think, to be honest, we wish we were different. <laughs> Um, we wish heaven's power would only work by rectifying everything. One day that's going to become true. But until then, what's amazing is it's not less than that for heaven's power. There's more than that that's happening now. And God's strengthening activity can be just as much at work and is just as much at work when the cancer remains as when the cancer disappears. When the person changes is when we can walk with them in the midst of difficulty or respond to them rightly in the midst of not change. Um, these are situations that are all within the realm of, God, please strengthen me for endurance and patience until the Lord Jesus comes again, really, is some of what's going on there. And then, mystery of all mysteries, as we come to the grammar of um, this passage, for all endurance and patience, there's this phrase there, with joy. And the grammar will not tell us decisively where the with joy goes. I think Paul's a pretty smart guy. He could have made it really clear if he wanted to. I, I kind of picture him being like, and I'll write this with joy in a way that's just kind of floating above and you need to decide. And maybe it's both and, right? So are we being strengthened to for all perseverance, for endurance and patience with joy. I think that's good and relevant that we could even have joy in the midst of the perseverance. And it also, I think, can go with the final participle, giving thanks to the Father. And I think it fits really well there too, that with joy, we would give thanks to the Father. This is one that every time I come to this passage, every time I speak about it, it continues to surprise me. You know, we're talking about all these things of fruit, a deeper knowing of God, strength for hard things, giving thanks. Giving thanks is amazing. It, it rarely makes my list of what, what is your will for me to do right now in this thing, whatever it is that I'm doing. Is there something that I can be giving thanks to God about with joy. And then, in case we might look at our circumstances and say, you know what, I, I really don't see anything worth giving thanks about in this particular situation. And that may be the case. Sometimes we're surprised that there's a lot we could give thanks about in the midst of that. Um, we can zoom out and think about other things we can be thankful for in our lives. But he also primes the pump with this reality that we can always give thanks for, that I think brings us to a very good place in prayer. Because he says, um, with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. 
He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. How often in prayer is really what we most need to land in the gospel? (laughs) And these beautiful... (laughs) I just love Paul's grammatical structure here. Sorry for geeking out on it. But these four participles, but then he goes through these three aorist verbs that, again, I think he does so because it can just be handles in our minds, and that's why it's there on your sheet just listed that way. Qualified, delivered, transferred. Lord, whatever I'm facing right now, part of what you would love is for me to have a heart that's thankful toward you. Why? should I be thankful to you? Because this is really hard and I'm not here yet or or I'm not in glory yet or whatever. Well, let's just think about it for a moment. You have qualified me to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. That's shorthand. You've qualified me for the new heavens and the new earth. Nothing can take away that passport. Nothing can take away that qualification. I could never qualify myself, but I am surely a citizen of it and will one day receive the fullness of it. All the darkness we experience right now, one day we will know nothing but the light of this heavenly inheritance. And you just marinate on that for a little bit. Boy, does that put some things in perspective. So you've qualified me for new creation glory, which is already at work in me now. You've delivered me as we get pulled down into the mess and the darkness and the difficulty of what's in our heart, what's in other people's hearts, the sin and suffering that we see all around us because Romans 5 tells us Adam messed up and it's really bad. (laughs) Even as we experience all of that, what we're going to hear about in our sermon is through the work of Christ, we have been delivered from it. Um, It is not what binds us anymore. Sin is not what is our master anymore. We are no longer under Adam We are under the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And nothing can change that by faith in Christ. We've been delivered from all those things that may haunt us about who we once were, or even those things that we still struggle with. We have been delivered from those things by the work of Jesus. And then finally, transferred. Transferred isn't just we were set free and like, go fend for yourself, figure out that Christian life thing. Nope. I'm going to take you from the domain of sin and darkness and death and everything that was in Adam, and I'm going to bring you into this kingdom of light where Jesus reigns as king, where your heavenly father welcomes you with love and affection as his children. You have been brought into it even now, and one day you will experience the fullness of all of that. And you marinate on that a little bit, and I think we can find ourselves saying, Thank you. Thank you, God, for doing all that. And as Anna said, if you have done all that, this is the Romans 8.32 part, right? If you've done all that already, then I can know your heart to me in this now. What you are seeking to do in my life, how much you love me, how much you will strengthen me, how much you will get me through, how much, even though I can't see it, you will help me to bear fruit. And one day, I will fully reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's happening even now. Um, So, hopefully those are handles and talking points. If, If I were still writing, I would just put those four participles here as just like, and this can just be a cheat sheet in your Bible um, for prayer, or a cheat sheet on your mirror, or at your desk at work, or whatever, of these prayers we're breathing out before the Lord. Um... We have time for one or two um, questions or comments or just insights about that, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Anyone have anything just as we've thought about um, being strengthened, giving thanks? Uh, Ted. <laughs> Ted's back in there. Thanks, Ted, for having the strength to signal me. Um, I just think there's a lot of situations where, you know, maybe it's, they're problematic or troubling in some way, but there's no immediate crisis. Yeah. And so that can be hard to know how to pray for those. And so I think this is useful for those types of situations. 
So it's going to be like a long process, but there's no immediate, you know, easy thing to pray for or something. It's just we need help going through some long-term thing. And this, yeah. all of these seem like useful, like a useful framework for those. Nice. Good. Yeah, I, I find that so encouraging about this is it applies to everything. And especially like you said, Ted, uh, to me, the longer I go in my Christian life, and you can tell me those who have been at it even longer than me, the fewer clear situations I think I see and the more everything is just, I need wisdom and I need help. And, and we all need this because until glory comes, <laughs> there often aren't easy answers. And so that, that's, these are beautiful that way. Anyone else with a closing thought? Well, thanks so much for processing through this with me. Hopefully it's been encouraging. Um, and the image you could walk away with is God isn't trying to get you to show up to a conversation and be like, I have no idea what to say to you. <laughs> but he's revealing his heart to us and giving us a picture of all these things that we can talk to him about. And uh, it will help jog our minds. And if you can't remember them, that's fine. But this passage could just be one handle that we turn to of um, bringing these things to the Lord in prayer. So let me pray, and then we'll um, fellowship, and then we'll worship God. Our Father in heaven, it's amazing that we can call you our Father and come to you in your love and affection and grace. We do so as those who are loved just as much as your Son, the Lord Jesus, and who have your Spirit working in us just as much as he did while he walked this earth. That's an amazing thing. And so we pray that you would help us, that you would help us to be people who turn to you as our loving Father, rather than try and figure things out on our own, whether that's out of pride or out of shame that we have before you or out of just thinking that that's how you want it to be. Help us to become people who run to you with these requests and who more and more see how you're powerfully at work, even when uh, things seem like they're not um, evidences of your glory and grace. And so help us to see these things even more and more and to trust you more in them. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.